In our level three advanced arrangement of Someday My Prince Will Come, be on the lookout for some more techniques being implemented. Things like borrowing from minor, setting up an introduction, uh, a more advanced rhythmic grid, and all sorts of other cool stuff. And be sure to stick around to the end of the video to see how to get access to today's arrangement and all of the other arrangements in today's series. If you're new to Amdex Music, we create music books and apps, piano arrangements, and we discuss improvisation, songwriting, and sometimes we take music theory to strange and uncharted places. So subscribe and hit the bell and join us for exclusive access to our ever-expanding library of music resources. So as you can see at the top of the page here, we have some suggestions for playing at the level three level. Um, we're going to be embellishing the melody more. You're going to maybe see some more enclosures. Again, uh, we're still building off the techniques we used in level one and level two. You're, so you're still going to see those and some other things peppered in as well. Uh, things like creating an intro and an outro and using modal interchange chords uh, to do so. We're going to further define our rhythmic grid uh, down to more of an eighth note subdivision. Last time we talked about using more of a quarter note pulse to define our grid. Now you're gonna see that kind of ramped up to an eighth note sort of level. And again, more broken chords on the left hand and uh, more layers in general and more clearly defined uh, bass lines as a result of that. So let's take a listen to this intro we've created and then talk about it. So what's going on in this intro? Well, one thing definitely worth uh, starting our conversation off with is our use of the dominant pedal point. This is a really great way uh, to build the tension into the piece, and therefore it's a great implementation, uh, or a great way to implement it, I should say, is in an intro. So the dominant of our key, or key is B flat, is F. So you, that's why you see this incessant use of the F on the bass, and that's why these are all slash chords. Um, and you can see in this first line here, we're just using chords from the song uh, on top of that F. These are all chords, if you look through the chart, that you can find in the chart. But a really cool thing about this uh, pedal point, when you have such a uh, clearly defined sort of anchor underneath you, uh, as this, this dominant pedal point serves as, you can kind of do whatever you want on top of it. And you can start taking chords that aren't in the key and introduce them into the intro like we have here with this D flat over F. And then following it, this C over F. That pedal point really kind of allows for anything to happen. It actually serves our purpose of, of building the tension to establish the key of the song and uh, uh, send us off on our head in a nice fashion. Something else worth noting uh, with the bass is how it's not playing on one, is how it's kind of filling out the spaces uh, offered up by the right hand. And we talked a little bit about this in level two, about like avoiding playing on one. And then you start to see that eighth note grid that we talked about start to get defined uh, in places like measure two, you have one, two, and three. All right, so the eighth note subdivision is gonna become more and more prevalent. Uh, the left hand is filling in the spaces offered up by the right hand. We're getting more, here it is again in measure six, one, two, and three, uh, one, two, and three. So we're starting to get more and more eighth notes and be on the lookout for that later on in the piece because like we said um, in the suggestions, that eighth note grid is gonna be a really important aspect of what makes level three level three. At the end of the intro, we have this upper structure chord, this D 
over F sharp, uh, I'm sorry, this D over F7. And we have a whole course surprise on upper structures, so uh, check that out if you wanna learn more about them. But basically what this offers us is a means of like highlighting some of the tensions in the chord and having it sound like uh, its own separate entity and it brings a new color to the voicing when you use upper structure. So that's what's going on in our last measure of the intro. You might also notice with this last chord of the intro, using our dominant pedal point this whole time, we've ended on a five chord. So we've ended on a chord that really establishes the key um, to the song. So this whole intro is a great way of illustrating how to use the dominant pedal point to establish the key, build the tension, and have that culminate on the five chord uh, of, the, of the key. And then you'll see on the next measure, boom, we're right on the B flat, the one of the key. So let's do this, let's listen to the intro, and then uh, maybe the first eight bars of our head and then talk about that. So this first measure really highlights some elements that we should lean into in level three and probably moving forward into level four. And that's this perspective of, well, the keyboard or the piano is, a, at the end of the day, it's percussion instrument. Uh, what would a drummer do? Or how would a drummer think? Or what is the, what is the drummer gonna do here? Bucha, bucha, right? And that's what we're doing here between uh, the left hand bass note and the right hand chord tones that aren't the melody. So adopting the mindset of of a drummer, so to speak. Not to mention, you see some of the things we talked about on level two going on here, this anticipation note, this F sharp, um, this rhythmic displacement, the G is now kind of, that was on three, is now on the end of two. All the things we talked about in the last level. Remember, we're still gonna be using those moving forward and just sprinkling on top other stuff as well. So let's, one more time, let's listen to those four measures we, just, we just talked about and then the four after so we can talk about what's going on there too. All right, so with those four, let's back up here to measure 17. So here you're gonna continue to see those layers that we were talking about and that drum, drum player mindset. Um, but also uh, we're really kind of taking the whole rhythmic displacement thing to the extreme here. Uh, for the G that lands on the downbeat of measure 17 is technically being continued through uh, the first two beats of the next measure to make room for this little nice chromatic ornamentation that we've put in there. And we don't really get to the E that was on the downbeat until the third beat of that measure. And then the B that was on the third beat is now on the and of three. So we have a really good use, uh, a really extreme use of rhythmic displacement here and, and yet it still works because we're all kind of lining up on the D in that next measure right where we're supposed to be. So we've got this really cool use of dotted quarter notes in three, four, um, and these measures over here. So more of the same, right? We're just kind of like uh, breaking chords on the left hand. There's some really cool chromatic ornamentations on the right. Nothing new there. Let's take a look at what's going on on this next line. Well, here you can see a much more clearly defined uh, representation of our layers that we were talking about earlier. Uh, four different pieces of our, of our drum set, right? A clearly defined bass, um, some harmony notes on the left hand, some harmony notes on the right hand, and the melody. So this is that perspective we were talking about more clearly illustrated here. Uh, when we were talking about it before. You can see in measure 26, the melody is present and accompanied uh, by other notes in the chord. We talked about that again in level two, but what's really cool is what's going on on these last two bars here. We have this just static F note in the melody, and we've just kind of created this really cool mixolydian line out of it, and we switched to even eighth notes uh, while doing so. We've been swinging the eighth notes all the way uh, to this point, and we're just gonna switch gears uh, because we want to. All 
All right, so let's talk about these lines here. So basically every note in this line uh, is either from an arpeggio, a scale, or is functioning as an approach tone to either a core tone or a scale tone. That's all this is. And furthermore, we're using uh, the melody, the old melody, F sharp, B, as a sort of scaffolding to build these lines from. And you'll find the melody embedded into these lines. Like right off the bat, you can see measure 29, that F sharp's right there, uh, the B in measure 30. Uh, this F sharp is on the and, so it's really displaced over to earlier in the measure. And we have the A from the next measure is actually in that measure too. So if you look closely, you're going to see all the notes that are in the original melody inside of our line. And again, they're just arpeggios, uh, scales, and approach notes. So you see the same thing happening in this next line that we're creating these, these lines through the arpeggios and the scales and the approach tones, and we're embedding the melody into the lines. Uh, but now we're going to expand, like we said earlier, on that um, that dotted quarter note rhythm we introduced, and now pairing it with these quadruplets on the right hand, which really turns the meter from three four into two four. So now we're really playing. Uh, now we're playing with that rhythmic grid. Not only are we kind of making it more complex, but we have this really hardcore like hemiola effect occurring here between the dotted quarter notes on the left hand and the quadruplets on the right embedded into a 3-4 grid. Really cool. And this whole shifting of the meter thing uh, kind of occurred gradually. It sort of evolved over a few measures. We didn't just jump into the quadruplets with the dotted quarter notes. Kind of set up the dotted quarter notes uh, against the even eighth notes a couple measures before uh, to sort of evolve that idea make it a little bit more palatable. Also, a little make it a little easier to play because now you have a sort of a, a subdivision of, of sorts to work with on the left hand so that when you do want to switch to the quadruplets on the right, it's a little easier. Something else that happens here is we sort of uh, start to obscure that eighth note grid that we were talking about. And uh, it, it's been in, it's in the listener's ear now, right? So we've already kind of beat them over the head with it and it's, it's embedded into them. So now we can kind of use this space by obscuring the grid, even though it's still kind of there. Uh, we can use that as an opportunity to stretch things out, introduce some rubato, um, and have some more flexibility and fun with the timing of the piece. And this is all kind of informed or launched, if you will, by this, this, this one, two, again, that sort of drummer perspective. That's totally something uh, a set player would do, this rhythm that we have going on here in measure 38. All set up by that. So we got a few things going on with our outro here. One of the things you might notice is uh, with these dominant chords, like this F7 here in measure 42 and the one at the end, we're altering them. We're introducing uh, an altered tension, the flat nine here and the sharp nine here. So something worth doing, or at least considering uh, when you're looking at the real book and you see a dominant chord, uh, altering it or using an altered tension is a really cool thing to do. Uh, another thing is that the, how this altered chord resolves in an unexpected place to, to the flat two of the key, not its expected target of B flat. We're sort of, well, I guess I guess the perspective is like, we're gonna get to that B flat. We're gonna get to it at the end and we're just kind of delaying the arrival to that chord. But this uh, F7 flat nine directly is followed by the flat two. And for this last, uh, this last little three measure snippet of the song, we just have a basic arpeggio on our one chord. Uh, and using an upper structure here at the end, this F over B flat major seven to highlight the major seven and the nine of the chord. So again, that F chord, the F, A, and the C has the fifth of our B flat chord, the major seven and the ninth. So these upper structures, again, are a great way to sort of highlight some of these tensions and introduce a different sort of color and texture to your chords. And that's what's going on here, just within the context of an arpeggio. All right, so now that we talked about everything, let's let's run it back and be on the lookout 
for all the things we talked about today. If you are already a member, go ahead and download your PDF of today's arrangement and every other arrangement in the series. If you'd like to become a member, go ahead and click on the join button or the link down below. Also, be sure to check out this video right here. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time.